started? Not started? Okay, it's unanimous. Okay. All right, it's opposite day though, so we're going to go ahead and get started. All right. All right, so um, let's see, a couple things. One, several of you have been to my office, and I'm very happy to meet with any of you who have questions. Please come by. I'd be more than happy to try to help you work problems and so forth. Uh, a couple people have pointed out that when you look on my calendar, it looks like all my appointments are an hour long, and that's not true. Uh, the default that my calendar puts in there is an hour. So generally, most of my appointments run 15 minutes or so. If you really want to know, send me an email, and I'll tell you, or uh, just come on by. You don't have to make an appointment if you don't want to. So my appointments really don't last an hour long. OK? All right. Um, today, I'm going to finish talking about protein structure. And then we're going to um, take some of our knowledge about the structure of proteins and uh, apply it to uh, allowing us to isolate and characterize those proteins. So um, that's pretty much what I'll be talking uh, about today. Last time I got you started, you might think I'm done, but I'm not done. I got you started on hemoglobin. Oh, by the way, the videos are a little slow. I was busy last night, so I didn't get quite caught up. The video for Monday is posted. Tuesdays will be posted later this evening, and maybe even Wednesdays, which is today's video as well. So should be all caught up. The, the highlights are caught up through yesterday as of all, right now on the web. So um, You thought maybe I, was just getting, I had finished, but I was just getting started about hemoglobin. The remarkable properties of hemoglobin are built into this molecule, I think, are, make it one of the most interesting proteins um, in the human body. Okay? So you've seen, for example, that hemoglobin can sort of adapt its affinity for oxygen depending upon where it is. Where oxygen's abundant, its affinity goes way up. It starts grabbing oxygen. And when, when hemoglobin goes out to the tissues where the oxygen concentration is low, it loses a lot of that affinity and starts losing a lot, not all, but a lot of its oxygen. I've shown you also in the Bohr effect, which was um, this graph that I finished up with last time, the Bohr effect, which showed you that if hemoglobin encounters a place where the pH is just even a little bit lower, its affinity for oxygen drops even more. And that's useful because exercising muscles, for example, have a lower pH because they're putting out protons. And they need oxygen more, so this complements each other very nicely. The hemoglobin is giving that more oxygen available to those muscle cells that need them, and they're flagging and saying, hey, we need oxygen, and hemoglobin says, okay, here's some oxygen. So I think that's very cool. We're going to see two more examples of hemoglobin being re very nicely adapted for uh, the environments and supplying the needs of the organism uh, today. One of these um, is um, a very interesting uh, phenomenon, and we know a lot about it now. It involves a molecule called BPG. We'll talk about BPG later in the term. For right now, all you need to know is that. It's also called 2,3-BPG. That's its, its name. And for its full name, which you don't need to know at this point, it's called 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Big mouthful of a name. All it really we need to worry about right now is what this molecule does. So I told you that tissues that are rapidly metabolizing things produce protons. They also produce carbon dioxide, which hemoglobin nicely scoops up and takes away for you. And a third thing that rapidly metabolizing tissues produce is BPG. Okay? So BPG, if we look around muscle cells, we'll find a lot of, excuse me, a lot of BPG. So that's the first thing that we, we, we think of here. All right. Well, what's the significance of BPG? There is the structure of hemoglobin shown schematically. Remember, we've got the four subunits. So we have quaternary structure. And when we look at this, we discover that there is a little slot in the middle of hemoglobin. And that little slot turns out to be almost exactly the right dimensions for BPG. So that little hole in the middle, the hole in the donut, as it were, is where this molecule called BPG can bind. Okay? When BPG binds to hemoglobin, what it does is it changes the configuration of hemoglobin again so that it has less affinity for um, uh, oxygen. Well, this works out nicely. Just like protons helped to reduce hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen, so too does BPG do the same thing. 
Now, I need to introduce just a, just a simple set of terms for you. It turns out that you see that there's actually, it's a little hard to see, but there's a little difference between the size of that gap and the size of that gap. Okay. When 2,3-BPG binds, it favors the transition from one state to the other state. Okay, So one state to the other state. And you don't need to know whether which one's bigger or whatever. That isn't what's important. It's changing hemoglobin's state from having relatively high affinity for oxygen to relatively low affinity for oxygen. So the binding of BPG is changing hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. It doesn't want to hold on to it as much when it's got BPG in it. Those two states have names. Okay? When it's in the high affinity state, it's called in the R state. That's when it has no BPG. When it has BPG, it's in what we call the T state. Now, R actually stands for relaxed, and T actually stands for tight. So a relaxed hemoglobin is able to hold on to oxygen better. A tight hemoglobin doesn't have, just like a tense person, doesn't have much flexibility, and it wants to let go of it, wants to get rid of it. Okay? So R and T are the two different states of hemoglobin, and BPG favors the T state, which favors it letting go of oxygen. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, that in itself is cool, but now I'll tell you a very practical human health component of that that we now know. Okay? It turns out that if we look in the blood supply, oh, I should also explain what happens. So the, the hemoglobin picks up 2, 3 BPG, uh, BPG, okay? And it's not a covalent binding. It goes on, it comes off, it goes on, it comes off, it goes on, it comes off. And so sometimes when it comes off, it gets grabbed by another cell, and the cell metabolizes it and breaks it down. So let's sort of follow the path of this stuff through the body. Hemoglobin's in the lungs. There's plenty of oxygen. It grabs the oxygen. It goes out to the tissues where it encounters protons and carbon dioxide and BPG. Okay? Protons and BPG can cause hemoglobin to dump oxygen, which it does. And if BPG binds to it, then it's in the T state and it's dumping oxygen. Doesn't really want to hold on to oxygen very much. Okay? That hemoglobin that has the BPG gets flowing through the bloodstream and it's on its way back to the lungs. And meanwhile, BPG is coming on, going off, coming on. Sometimes it comes off and a cell says, ooh, that looks yummy, and grabs it and eats it. Okay? So by the time that the, the hemoglobin gets back to the lungs, there's no BPG. That's good. Because if you had BPG when it gets back to the lungs, what's going to happen to hemoglobin wanting to pick up oxygen? It's not going to want to pick it up, right? Because it's in the low binding affinity state. So it's important that that happen, that that be broken down by the time it gets back to your lungs. Well, guess what? Smokers have high levels of BPG high levels of BPG. And so what happens is it doesn't get broken down as much. It gets all the way back to the lungs, and now some of the hemoglobin has BPG attached to it, and the smoker can't get as much oxygen in their blood supply as a non-smoker can. This is why a smoker huffs and puffs when they climb stairs. Okay, That's why they've got too much BPG. Now, the next question you get is, why do they have too much BPG? In order to understand that, we'll have to talk about metabolism later. But there is a very good reason why that's the case. Okay? Smokers have higher levels of BPG in their bloodstream. Another thing that smokers have in their bloodstream that is really a problem is they have a lot of carbon monoxide, which we saw yesterday will compete with oxygen for binding to hemoglobin. So those two things combined make the oxygen carrying capacity of a smoker be less than that of a non-smoker. Okay? A real good argument against smoking. Okay? Questions on that? Yes, sir? Um, you said that when hemoglobin goes out to the tissues, it picks up O2, CO2, or CO. So when um, hemoglobin is in the tissues, it's letting go of O2. It's picking up protons. It's picking up CO2, and it shouldn't be picking up any carbon monoxide. Cells don't produce a lot of carbon monoxide, although if there is any there, it could do that. Now keep in mind that CO, that CO carbon monoxide, is binding in the oxygen binding site, 
CO2 does not bind in the oxygen binding site. CO2 is binding where those protons bind. Okay, different places. Okay, and that's a common confusion, by the way. Okay, carbon monoxide competes with oxygen. Carbon dioxide does not compete with oxygen. Questions? Yes. Um, they're the, essentially the same thing. So the rate and the affinity, you, you can think of in the same way. You, you would have a hard time distinguishing them. Yeah. Okay, so now I said there were two things. The first one is BPG. That's pretty cool. The second one I've got to tell you about is fetal hemoglobin. Okay? So the fetus has got to have oxygen. The, he, the fetus has got to get oxygen from mom. That's, mom's, that's the fetus's only source of oxygen. Because if it doesn't have oxygen, it ain't going to be a fetus. Right? Well, if the fetus had the same hemoglobin as mom, it would be fighting a constant and probably losing battle with mom's hemoglobin. And it turns out that the fetus has a different, a slightly different hemoglobin. And that slightly different hemoglobin is pretty cool. Okay? Adult hemoglobin is what I described to you as having alpha 2, beta 2. Two identical alpha units and two identical beta units. And the fetus, as it's developing, it's not making the beta units. It's making two similar units called gamma. So fetal hemoglobin contains two alpha and two gamma subunits. And the overall structure looks very, very similar to that of adult hemoglobin with one big exception. The big exception is it doesn't have a binding site for BPG. It doesn't have, you know, it's, it's got a hole, but the hole is of the wrong dimensions to hold BPG. Now, let's think about this. Mom's hemoglobin has an ability to bind BPG. The fetus doesn't have an ability to do that. In mom, the binding for a BPG caused the, the, the mom's hemoglobin to change into the T state, so it caused it to have less affinity for oxygen. The fetus doesn't have that ability, and so the fetus's ability to bind oxygen is always greater than mom's. It's always greater than mom's which means that a fetus can literally take oxygen away from mom's hemoglobin. Okay? The fetus can take oxygen away from mom's hemoglobin. This graph shows you graphically what I'm telling you in words. Okay? And that is, here is the, um, the plot of uh, saturated with oxygen in blue for mom versus that of the fetus. A higher line, a line in a higher place, means more binding, which means more affinity. So this line is telling us now that the fetus can take oxygen away from mom's hemoglobin. Now, one question I frequently get is, well, what if mom's smoking? What if mom is smoking? How does that affect the fetus's ability to carry oxygen? What do you think? Okay, so there's less oxygen coming in the system. Mom's, mom's hemoglobin is going to have less oxygen, that's for sure. But what about the ability of the fetus to carry oxygen? It doesn't change. Okay? Now, I'm not advocating smoking because mom's smoking is causing less oxygen to be available in the first place. But even if the um, um, BPG crosses the, plac the, uh, the uh, placental barrier, it won't affect the fetal hemoglobin because there's no binding site for it on there. So it doesn't change the fetus's binding. Well, that's an interesting question. So what happens then if, um, if um, I'm losing my train of thought. You get in front of a whole group of people and you forget what you're going to say. That's really bad. I do, do that sometimes. Okay, what happens if the, um, i got to get it out there. If the, uh, are there disadvantages for the fetus? The fetus has got this, this hemoglobin that's there. Why does it stop making okay, fetal hemoglobin when about the time of birth? Why does it stop making fetal hemoglobin and start making adult hemoglobin? Why not just keep fetal? Well, 